A man jailed over a brawl that led to the one-punch death has lost a bid to appeal his sentence. Homicide detectives are investigating the death of a man following a one-punch attack. A 16-year-old boy is in an induced coma following a brutal one-punch attack. Protesters called for the government to impose new laws so King hit attackers jailed for a minimum of 10 years. Anyone found guilty of a fatal one-punch attack faces a mandatory 10 years in prison. Controllers and security guards play a vital role in providing a safe environment in our communities and through this creating a safer Victoria. The private security industry is overseen and regulated by Victoria Police's Licensing and Regulation Division. The relationship between police and private security personnel is significant and one which relies on mutual respect for each other's roles. There is an expectation that crowd controllers and security guards will cooperate with law enforcement in maintaining social order. With the rise in positional restraint asphyxia and one-punch assault cases, this educational DVD serves as a timely reminder of the dangers associated with such incidents and the important role that you play in preventing them from occurring. responsibilities of crowd controllers and security guards? Well, the thing is that they've got to comply with their training and maintain a very high standard of probity and a very high standard of control of any situation. And that, of course, means de-escalating potentially violent situations. When people go out to be entertained, whether it's a crowd controller or a private security guard, they expect that they're going to do so safely in a non-violent atmosphere. What happens when they step outside of that training and that role that they're set within? At the very least, they might subject themselves to an investigation, which could see their licence be suspended and eventually cancelled, so they can't work in the industry anymore. And the second thing that can happen, which is more dire, is they might face criminal charges. This is typical of any nightclub in Victoria that any crowd controller would be confronted with. It's 2.11am going on 2.12. As you can see, this patron's been forcibly removed by two crowd controllers, followed by a third, who in a short space of time kicks him violently to the midriff, just there, before it escalates even further on the outside. Cut to outside the club, and the patron is thrown to the road by two crowd controllers, while a third bouncer slaps him to the head. He's then followed down the road, and, unsuspecting to the patron, he's violently punched. His head hits the road, knocking him out. While the crowd controller who threw the punch fails to render any assistance, the bouncers who do help move the unconscious man to an incredibly dangerous seated position against the wall. Sometimes the failure to render assistance is just as bad as rendering really poor assistance. Nearly everything that occurred from a crowd controlling and security perspective on this night at this venue was everything that went totally against the, the training that they've all been offered. Following this incident, the crowd controller's licence was cancelled by Victoria Police, a decision which was upheld by VCAT upon appeal. While this nightclub patron walked away from the one-punch assault, it's not always the case. We left the venue with some friends. There was a scuffle between two guys and then one of the guys who worked at the club took a swing at me and connected and I fell and landed on the pavement. My wife was told that it's not looking good at all, unlikely that I'd make it through. And they had an operation, I believe. And then there was a further bleed to which they had to have another operation. He had problems maintaining his airway. He had to have an anaesthetic, put a breathing tube down his throat and then go on and have uh, his CT scans to define the injury. So it showed a fracture of the skull on the left side, which went through the inner ear. And more importantly, there was a lot of bruising and bleeding over the surface of the brain on the other side. So if you can imagine the brain sits like jelly in a box and uh, you can hit your head 
on the concrete and then the whole brain wobbles around inside and you get what's called a contra coup injury where the, the brain goes towards the side of the injury and then ricochets back and hits the inside of the skull. And that can cause a lot of damage. Michael's road to recovery has been a long one. As well as suffering permanent hearing loss, there's a much deeper impact. And to have to rush to hospital at bedside vigils, all that kind of stuff, I sort of feel a bit embarrassed by the fact that they had to go through that because of me. To this day, I still harbour a bit of guilt around that. Most people never fully recover from these injuries. I mean, your brain's this sort of perfect object, and uh, once it's injured, it's impossible to get back to 100%. I read the news, obviously, and seeing the regular occurrence of these type of incidences, be they at nightclubs or just in general society, yeah, it does, it haunts me a little bit. While Michael's around to tell his story, so many one-punch assault cases end here as the subject of a post-mortem, an investigation in the coroner's court. Dr Jennifer Pilgrim studied 100 recent incidents of one-punch assaults and found most involved young men out at a hotel or pub on a Friday or Saturday night. So there are a number of factors coming together, aren't there? It's alcohol, groups of young men going out on the town and just not realising the repercussions of your actions. Absolutely. And I mean, of course, the, the victim in these situations is, is the most terrible situation to think about. But um, the perpetrators as well, I mean, this changes their lives forever. Most of these instances are where the person did not know that this was going to be the, the outcome of that one punch. And it's changed their lives forever. I mean, they've killed somebody and, and some of them are spending a long time in jail. When a crowd controller or security guard chooses to act outside the scope of their training, the outcome can be fatal, leading to a lengthy coronial investigation. You could also face serious criminal charges that could land you in jail due to newly introduced legislation which has brought about minimum mandatory sentencing. Remember, the outcome of any incident is primarily judged by which the use of force was avoided or minimised. What we're witnessing is quite clearly an agitated and prior to this, a, a possibly violent shoplifter. This is an example of the choices made by the security guards in this particular incident is not in line with their training. As far as the regulator is concerned, the use of force here is not proportionate to the objective to restrain a confrontational individual. A security guard can be seen maintaining a hold around the patron's neck. It's a hold that's putting the patron in an incredibly vulnerable position. The situation escalates as up to 10 untrained staff members add their weight to the person laying face down with his arms behind his back. The patron continues to struggle. I would suggest that those security guards have no comprehension or understanding what the struggle is about now. It's highly probable that he's struggling to breathe at this stage due to the hold. As a result of this incident, the patron was rushed to hospital and the security guards involved were subject to a criminal investigation. The person's gone from trying to defend themselves sometimes against somebody or they've been aggressive and such like, and now they've got someone who's basically almost lifeless in front of them. But, but people just can't switch from one scenario to the other immediately. They still see the person as a threat. So that's the dilemma of trying to sort of control people but not kill them at the same time. Positional asphyxia can be defined as obstruction of breathing as a result of restraint technique. It occurs when a person's body is positioned in a way that interferes with their ability to breathe. Any body position that interferes with breathing can cause death, and security personnel must be aware of the dangers. You can't choke or obstruct someone until they're unconscious and then expect them to get up and get back to a normal life. It just doesn't work like that. It's 12.23 a.m. going on 12.24 a.m. where inadvertently and unsuspectingly to the crowd controllers, a fight breaks out between patrons. No one was ejected after this violent dance floor brawl and security cameras show patrons openly smoking in front of crowd controllers. On review of the CCTV, it became apparent that patrons involved in the fight were clearly known to and friendly with security staff. This is at the conclusion of the night and this nightclub has now been shut for over 10 minutes and the people involved in the original altercation in, in the dance floor are still allowed to loiter outside the nightclub instead of being moved on in accordance with their training. 
The men who were allowed to loiter outside the club are seen following the victims into a laneway where a violent assault takes place. A gang of thugs is on the run after violently ambushing two brothers in an alley outside a nightclub and bashing them unconscious. It ends with this brutal blow. This is a timely reminder to those receiving their training that they also have a responsibility to render assistance to an injured patron that was in their venue. Not one of the crowd controllers rendered any assistance and not one of the crowd controllers rang any emergency service, either ambulance or police. This assault, as far as we're concerned, it would have been completely avoidable if the crowd controllers on the night had have acted in due diligence in accordance with their training and moved on the patrons at the earliest opportunity and ejected them well before this incident occurred. All 12 of the crowd controllers on duty that night had their licenses suspended. If your license is suspended, you're not permitted to work in any capacity in the private security industry. When you risk assess, you need to think about the fact that your actions have consequences or your inaction has consequences. And if you're observing things going on and allow them to go on either by your colleagues in the security industry or by patrons in the uh, environment in which you're providing security, remember that quote that the standard that you walk past is the standard you accept. Communication is absolutely vital in any volatile situation, apart from anything else, to try to calm things down, but also give people clear direction of what you want them to do. My last message to you is listen to everything you've been told here. Look at the things that we've showed you. Look at the uh, behaviours that are incorrect and don't do them and listen to the advice you've been given by the various experts. And if you follow that advice, you'll work in a good, clean industry for a long time. As a crowd controller or security guard, you've chosen a career that has a pivotal role in our community. But safety has to always come first. Remember, good decisions lead to good outcomes. I hope you enjoy your training. Thank you.